Okay, welcome ladies and gentlemen. Um, this is the meeting of the local pension board. It's the 3rd of September 2021. I'm Amanda Brown, the APR authorities clerk. I'm opening this meeting today, which is the adjourned local pension board meeting from the 12th of August, which you will recall could not go ahead because we brought a court on that occasion. So we're now reconvening today on the 3rd of September and the first item on the agenda is the election of chair for the municipal year. Um, can I have a proposer please? I propose Councillor Chris Windows. Thank you very much, Councillor Brown. And a seconder please? No, second. Thank you, that's Stephen McGreevy from the Fire Brigade Union who seconded. Uh, anyone uh, object to this appointment? Anyone abstain? Are you happy? happy yes, that's fine. Yes. Excellent. Okay, well, congratulations. You are the new chair for this oh, municipal year. So I will now hand over the script to you. Thank you very much, Councillor Windows. Thank you, Amanda. Well, a day good morning to everybody. Um, first item here is uh, apologies for absence. Do we have any apologies apart from my from <laughs> It's just uh, Amanda Mills from the Fire Brigade Union, who oh. was only going to be a substitute if needed. Right, okay, thank you for that. Um, item three is the uh, emergency evacuation procedure, which I think is down to you. Yes, so um, if you, we're also expecting a, a fire alarm. If there is a fire alarm, then um, you follow me, um, and we'll get out there to the right, and then down the stairs, and then um, follow the evacuation procedures from there. Thank you very much. Um, item four is down to me. Um, in view of the continuing prevalence of COVID-19, we have decided to continue COVID measures in the HQ and have had to limit the number of attendees and the entry of press and public. For this reason, the meeting will be video recorded and uploaded onto our YouTube channel. I'd like to welcome new attendees to the meeting. Councillor Andrew Brown, which is over here, and he's replacing Councillor Robert Payne. Um, Gary, I understand that you recently advised that you would be standing down from the local pension board, if we let you. Um, I'd like to thank you on behalf of myself and the board for all your hard work. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Good. Look, hang on, there's more. <laughs> that we put in over the years. Best of luck for the future, Gary. Confirmation of the process to appoint Gary's replacement will follow. Yes, that, that process is set out in terms of reference, but we need to agree the process at the Right. Um, now I'm going to ask the attendees to introduce themselves um, and I'll start with me and we go in a clockwise direction. I mean, you'll be last. Um, I'm Chris Windows, as you probably guessed already. Um, I'm a representative from Bristol for uh, the Board of Henry and Brentry and I was given this job and I will do it to the best of my ability and I'll pass over to Amanda. Uh, good morning, I'm Amanda Brown, I'm the clerk for Avon Fire Authority. Good morning, I'm Emma Bowen, Democratic Services Assistant for Avon Fire and Rescue. Good morning, I'm Joanne Watt, personal assistant to Avon Fire Authority. Uh, good morning, uh, Jeff Bleak, uh, Avon Pension Fund, Minister of the uh, Fire Crisis Pension Scheme. Um, um, good morning, I'm Anna Camp and I'm Avon Petrofans, so thank you. Uh, Gary Stinder, soon to be retired, Fire Brigade Union Brigade Secretary. Stephen Ruby, uh, Fire Brigade Union Chair. Uh, Andrew Brown, Councillor for Hengrove and the Church Park Ward in Bristol. Uh, 
Angela Harrison, uh, this was the Council of Democratic Services. And I'm Angie Feeney, I'm the Director of Corporate Services here at England Fire Rescue Service. Thank you everybody for that. <coughs> um, now, I have to advise you that if we require any voting to, be, to take place, um, it will be as follows. Any votes against go first, any abstentions follow, if there are any, and the remaining votes will be by a show of hands. Okay. Right, thank you for that. Um, next item is public access, and we have not received any. Uh, item six, conflicts of interest. Um, I think that's over to you, Amanda. Yes, that's right. Um, so I've just checked the provisions about conflict of interest, and under the Public Service Pensions Act 2013, it actually defines for the purposes of this meeting what would be a conflict of interest. So I think it might just be useful for me to remind everyone. So conflict of interest in relation to a person means a financial or other interest which is likely to prejudice the person's exercise as functions as a member of the board, but does not include a financial or other interest arising merely by virtue of membership of the scheme or any connected scheme. Um, I would ask, however, because we are also going to be discussing the immediate detriment issue for any uh, conflict of interest declarations for those affected by the immediate detriment issue. So, yeah, so on, the, on the immediate detriment, Person. Person. Super. Okay, thank you. So I'll just record that in the register. Thank you very much. Okay, item seven is uh, the minutes of the last pension board meeting held on the 19th of January this year. Does anybody have any? queries or alterations or anything they're not happy with in the minutes as presented. I think Councillor Brown wasn't here at that meeting, so he wouldn't be able to, to sort of assist with whether they're accurate. I think, Gary, you were here yeah, at that meeting. Right. And I think, Steve, as well, you were here. So. <coughs> Okay, that's fine. Thank Are you people happy with the minutes? Yes, all yeah. agreed? Yeah. Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. We'll so sign. Thank you. Okay. Super. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Now, this is a regulatory and legislative time and another drink update, um, which is item eight, and Jeff says you're going to present. So over thank, to you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Yes. Um, just very briefly, a, a regulatory update has been included in the papers for noting. Uh, this gives the position on key issues at, as at the end of June uh, this year. Uh, some key updates from the report. Um, that um, sort of carried forward to the 19th of July. Uh, the HM Treasury have now introduced the uh, Public Service Pensions Bill to the House of Lords. Um, this bill sets out how the government will remove uh, the discrimination uh, identified by the courts uh, in the way that the 2015 reforms were introduced uh, for some members. Uh, this is the primary legislation which closes the final salary scheme for accrual past the 31st of March 2022 and moves all remaining members into the Fire Pension Scheme 2015, whilst ensuring that exiting transitional protections such as the final salary link and double accrual uh, are retained. Uh, the Home Office have produced some guidance and frequently asked questions for Fire Pension Pension Scheme members, um, and this provides some, a detailed sum, summary of how the bill legislates the, move, the removal of the discrimination uh, identified. Uh, to implement remedy uh, in full, both primary and secondary legislation are required, uh, as well as administration work uh, at local and national level to implement the changes. Uh, the deferred choice underpin will be implemented by October 2023. Uh, and in May, the uh, LGA, Local Government Association, launched the first national website for firefighters pension scheme members. 
by providing a central resource for firefighters to find out uh, more about their pension scheme and the benefits and options available, including development as they emerge. Uh, you will see from the paper there's been no further update on the likely commencement date for scope of the rectification exercise that will be required following the Matthews case. Um, that's, that's still pending. Uh, and finally, uh, HMT uh, published a consultation on the cost control mechanism which seeks views on the change in the cost, cost control mechanism in all public and service pension schemes. And that was a consultation closed in August. So I'd have to take any questions if there are any. Questions? No? That was short and sweet. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad everybody followed it. Um, thank you for that, Jeff. Um, item nine is a pension board update. And I think that's over to you, Angie. Yes? yes. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Uh, this is a paper for, in part for voting and consideration and in part uh, for a decision. And the decision relates to um, the use, the potential use of a contingency provision which is already in the internal audit um, plan for this year to ask internal audit to test the control framework which is put in place for immediate detriment processing given its complexity. Uh, I'll return to the recommendations at the end of my, my introduction. As a number of you will, will know, the Fire Authority on the 30th of June 21, having considered the latest Home Office LGA guidance and also QC advice, decided to enable those retiring before 2023 to access legacy scheme benefits for the period of the 1st of April 15 to the 31st of March 22, uh, with a number of caveats and exceptions which are outlined in the paper. And those caveats and exemptions adhere to the guidance and advice that was received by the Fire Authority. The Fire Authority also delegated oversight for the administration of this um, process to LPB. So this, role has a, so this board has a scrutiny role in terms of looking at how we will process those payments um, under immediate detriment and in accordance with, with what the Fire Authority has agreed. And this is the core matter for LPB today and the paper. You'll see from uh, paper, sorry, paragraph 5.2 of the paper refers to recommendations from the LGA on how to process immediate detriment cases and the things that we need to take into consideration. And this, this paper takes LPB, LPB through the actions which have been taken so far in respect of those LGA recommendations and also uh, actions which are planned. I don't intend to go through all of the detail in the paper, it's of it's quite some considerable length, but I will summarise as follows. First of all, the, the, the paper says that there has been a technical group in operation to look at how we process immediate detriment, and that consists of Bristol City Council, our payroll provider, Baines, our pensions provider over here today, um, our internal HR team and finance team, um, and I am the chair of that, of that working group. That working group has now um, developed a methodology for the following. First of all, identifying who, who is currently in service is in the immediate detriment group. Then collating, recording, and checking all the information which would first of all be needed to assess who, is it, who in that group would be in or out of scope of what has been agreed with the fire authority, and then to run the calculations. And to give you an indication of the work that is involved in that short sentence, uh, that does require seven years of historic data uh, being collated across all members of the technical working group to rebuild that final salary record as it would have been under the old schemes. Further complicated by the fact that the schemes are different in terms of what is pensionable and what isn't pensionable. That technical working group has also um, established a process for running the calculations and for also a um, quality assurance though of those ones and testing. And that then enables us for the people who we establish as being in scope to be issued with two estimates so they can make a choice. And one is an estimate under full uh, legacy scheme and the other one is under the current arrangement which is part legacy and part 2015 scheme. 
also established a process for how we calculate employee and employer contributions owed. So this is the fact that um, those contributions are owed by both parties if the legacy scheme is, is put into effect. We also establish a process for the treatment of allowances which are pensionable under one scheme and not under the other scheme. We also establish further processes for quality assurance and that's both within our pensions provider and also now with Bristol City Council and a process for resolving issues and complaints. That process is through what we call the IDRP, the Internal Dispute Resolution Procedure um, and as indicated in my paper we do have someone who has already made use of that process which has been established for that reason. We've also established record keeping protocols which will be um, important We've also established how we will deal with this in terms of risk management. Um, as you will see sort of in, in uh, a further paper, it has now been specifically added as a, a risk uh, on its own to the, the risk register, which is both the local pension board risk register, but also reflected in our overarching corporate uh, risk register. We've also established a process for any breaches of laws to be reported and also for conflict of interest protocols, which we, we've heard um, from Amanda today. We also have some proposals, which are being considered also later on in the agenda, for ensuring that the level of knowledge and understanding within the LPB for the scrutiny needed of this very complicated issue. There's also been a range of communications in place and planned for our employees, and also a method to raise questions has been established. We have also, through, um, through the technical group and for running our first cases through, established the timescales which will be involved. And the timescales involved will be from the point that somebody puts in their, their formal notice of retirement, a 12-week period to enable us to do all of the assessments I've described and to run the calculations. We've also developed a range of template letters to employees of each stage and we are trialling those ones with our first people going through. Um, to, to immediate detriment of payments. In terms of the next steps which are outlined in 5.13 of my report, the key ones to note is that um, we are now in a position where we will be putting our first immediate detriment case into payment in September. We plan further communications for our employees and also retirees. We are starting to process now, as it was identified in the next steps, was to establish those in the ill health retirement category who, were due, who we anticipated will be retiring through ill health by 2023 in order to start to also provide remedy payments to those. And also a process to encourage firm indication of retirement dates, which helps us not only for this process, but also for workforce planning. And the paper, as described, indicates that we have received one complaint through IDRP, which is being dealt with as is due process through the People and Culture Committee. As further updates, because there has been a gap between uh, the, when this paper was written and the previously arranged LPB and the LPB today, um, I can also confirm that um, having established those ill health retirement cases, we are also in the process of assessing our first ill health retirement case um, under the potential to go under the legacy scheme. And also, um, we have confirmed um, with all of the providers, as per the Power Authority decision, that we have ceased ta tapering with effect from the 1st of July. And also, as is also indicated in the paper, um, contact has been made with a ACAS, who are now supporting us with the compromise agreements which are discussed, which are given, as I say, the, the complexity involved in this and the potential risk and liabilities. Uh, but we'll add that, that f uh, further layer of protection and ever has been with our authority. So that sum summarises the paper. Before I move to kind of questions, I will just recap on the recommendations in the paper. So the board is asked to note the progress made, to consider the processes in place to administer immediate detriment cases in accordance with the decisions made by the Bible for our authority as a scheme manager, to raise any questions or concerns about the governance and administration of their processes in compliance with the relevant Home Office LGA guidance and pension reg regulatory requirements. Decide whether to request through the Audit Government and Ethics Committee Chair that internal audit test the authority's control framework for the processing of immediate detriment cases and to do so by the end of this calendar year. 
Ms. Recommendation refers to, and I've, I've said all, all the way through, and I think we're involved in this, the complexity of it, and also the, the fact that we have limited guidance. We have no central software at the moment, so a lot of these calculations are manual. Um, and, and that is a lot to kind of work through technically. And therefore, there is the, the, the further provision with internal audit to do some testing for us of that independently, should there be anything that they identify that we can tighten up within our control framework. And the recommendation is to do this before the end of the calendar year, because then um, we can make sure that we invoke anything that they are recommending going forward for, for, the, for the rest of the time up until 2023. There is also a proposal to instruct myself to refer the immediate detriment matter back to an extraordinary LPB meeting as required to update LPB and discuss any particular issues causing the administrative concern relating to the processing of immediate detriment cases. I think that's my run through of, of the, the paper. As I say, it was kind of a lengthy one to, to run through, but I hope that provides some of the key, key elements to it. I'm very happy to take any questions or comments. From the um, first of all, from um, from the news when we'd like to express our thanks to the service for taking on and moving faster than most, <laughs> not as fast as some, but definitely uh, at a speed that shows, um, with some reasonable concern, you know, the, the efforts to try and remedy the situation. Uh, we understand it has been easy. Um, we also acknowledge the fact we haven't reached the end yet, uh, and we're still pushing for you to do more, as you would quite rightly expect. But um, you know, the the moves that we've made has definitely been um, a positive one, uh, and on that we'd like to thank you, especially from the, the pensions people as well. We, we you know, the work that needs to be done, we fully understand. You know, when we ask for more, of course we're going to ask for more, but it is with that background that we understand the, the limitations. Um, and I think that's. You know, some work is nationally carried out to force some moves locally, but um, you've definitely helped us try and move some other brigades and assist other members. So for that, you know, we are grateful for that. Thank you. Um, on some of our issues, um, the move to test the, the audit, governance and ethics committee to test some of our work, um, also I'm, I'm not against it being tested per se, I think one thing that is clear is the fact that people on this board sometimes struggle with some of the details. And who who is in a better position on the on that committee to test what this board deems acceptable? Um, it doesn't seem to doesn't seem to compute. If you know what I mean, why are we sending to another committee who don't know about pensions to test how pension work? So if you can clarify that for me, that yeah. So what they test is what we call uh, the control frameworks, and so that is the sort of systems, arrangements, and procedures in place by the authority. So what they will test is the, is the processing of it, okay. rather than the detail of it. And that just gives us an independent look. Um, actually, have we got all of the process and procedures and checkbacks in place? Um, so it's more around that control framework than actually the technicalities and of the And it's the auditors so. who do that testing, so yeah. qualified finance professionals right. and risk experts who okay. test yeah. it, and then they send their report to the other committee because right. that's the right committee to consider all different okay, things. That makes more so sense. it's not the committee that are doing the yes. testing. In many ways, the committee's reading the report of the technical people who've looked into it. Is that right, Angie? Yeah, so that, that's exactly what internal audit would do. Once we commission yeah. work, they would look across their portfolio about who <coughs> we have the relevant expertise to do that. Yeah. But as I say, they don't get into the technicalities of the pension aspect. Just the it's process. more around the process of it to make sure that we're not missing a step. Yeah, no, that, that, that makes more sense now. It, to me, it, it was like, hang on a minute, we struggle, we're supposed to be the, the CC trained experts, how absolutely. are they going to justify yeah. our work? Exactly, that, that it, it, it's, it's a good question. So I get that, so, yeah. no problem. Um, it, it's, it's good to hear that we're now looking at ill health. Um, that, again, I'll take back to members as a real positive. Um, you know, as I said to, to Jeff earlier, we understand that there are limitations just on how many people can do these calculations. Um, but at the same time, if we can move them forward, then it, it's it's all good, isn't it? Um, there's one point that uh, 
draft in the, on the compromise agreement through ACAS. Um, although we sit as representatives from the employees, from the FBU's point of view, um, can we have admitted that we, and so straight I say this, that don't agree that process, however we know that process. Um, and that is simply for um, legal reasons moving forward, because it's, in our view, it's up to individuals to be aware of that process and make their own decision as to whether they sign it or not. Um, so whilst we know that process, it's not something that we recommend to members uh, sign initially, it's up to them to make their own informed decisions. I don't see an issue with that. I think from a legal point of view, the fire authority will advise that there are risks in making payments before yeah. new pension regulations are issued. Yes. And therefore, the recipient must acknowledge that they're taking potentially an imperfect solution and they sign what's effectively a disclaimer as a compromise Absolutely. agreement. So saying, look, we accept that we're getting this early before the regulations are issued. Um, the QC wanted um, ACAS involved in that process simply because it gives the agreement more standing in the eyes of the courts because you've had the benefit of expert advice from yeah. ACAS. Yeah. If an individual wishes to get their own legal advice on top of that from somebody else, it's a matter for them. Yeah. So, so whether or not FBU members like ACAS being involved, they've still got an option to get their own advice. Yeah, and at the end of the day, as you've rightly said, it's for the member to decide if they want to sign the compromise agreement or not. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, no one can force them to sign no, it. It, 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 it was simply a, uh, a legal thing that we've been asked to do. Yes. Uh, because we sit on the board as brigade officials, yes. um, and this paper is going to be agreed by this board, yes. um, the fact that we want the difference, the fact that we know that approach, and therefore it's not a, a recommendation to members sign it. It was just that that difference. That was all. And I think for any um, any sort of pension members who who, who might be, be watching, might have to explain a little bit about the process as well. I've been spoken to kind of ACAS. So in the process of ACAS issuing what they call a COP three agreement, they they do provide support to the individuals to talk them through that agreement. So they understand what they are then signing up to. Yeah. Um, so that will be in the letters to the individuals. But they are also then said that, of course, if they want to seek additional legal advice on top of that, and and or also financial advice, then they do need to do that of, of their own kind of best. But but of course, it does remain the case that in order to receive immediate detriment um, payments, that those those agreements will need to be signed. Yeah. But we'll make sure when the minutes are prepared that you've got each chair to make sure the wording is right. Any other questions? Yeah, I've got a question on the. Um, sorry, Gary, will you finish? Oh, sorry. No, sorry, no, sorry. Yeah. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've got a question on the um, the setting up the uh, process for calculation employer contribution sorting. So I understand it's obviously not as urgent as ensuring that member contributions are made before. <laughs> Before um, benefits are paid out, yeah. um, what's the sort of time frame for um, the starting that process for the employer contributions, and are there any sort of knock on implications um, for the scheme yeah. um, and then sort of lack? Yeah, so I um, think we're still waiting for those time scales from, from government in terms of actually how they intend to do the wider remedy and actually how they then are going to resolve the implications that that will have for employers in terms of the costs incurred. Um, so we will still wait to do that. We don't know whether that will be um, additional payments or it will be baselined in, in some kind of way. But what we've done in anticipation of, at some point, we will need to know what the employer contribution impact is. What we've decided within the technical group is to collect that information at this point, rather than needing to return to it at a future point. So, so yeah, we're in the kind of government's hands to understand that, but at least we're a bit ahead of the curve that we know what those contributions are. Yeah, the, 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 that that is extra piece of the gym yeah. okay any other questions for anyone shall we revert to the recommendations then so so the first two are the board is to note the progress made in relation to the immediate detriment issue. The second is to consider the processes in place to administer the immediate detriment cases in accordance with the decisions made by a fire project scheme manager. 
And then the, these are the decisions, really, that you're making. So C is raise any questions or concerns about the governance and administration of these processes and compliance with the relevant Home Office and LGA guidance and pension regulatory requirements. So has anyone spotted anything in the processes that have been outlined in this paper that they feel raises an issue of concern that they wish to raise to them? No. So, so that's a, a negative for C then, good. And then D, to decide whether to request through the Audit Governance and Ethics Committee Chair that internal audit, the auditors, test the authority's control framework for the processing of immediate detriment cases and do so by the end of this calendar year. Um, so that's a decision for you to make today. And the final decision is whether you're happy to instruct the lead officer, director of corporate services, LG, to refer this matter back to you as an extraordinary meeting, as and when required, to update you and discuss any particular issues which have come to light. So are we happy to take those? So we've confirmed that C is no, so that can come out. But in relation to decisions A, B, D and E, are we happy to take those collectively and to vote on those? Uh, so just on the on B, yes. uh, are the lead officer um, able to, to call an extraordinary meeting? Um, is there any possibility that that could work both ways for any member to call or at least have that discussion? Um, I'm just conscious of the fact that um, to go to full file authority over some of these yes. decisions isn't necessarily beneficial because no. of the discussion. No. However, um, there's certainly some legal aspects from our point of view yes. that we may want to discuss uh, with the board, whether that be formally or informally. Um, I don't see an issue with that. I believe standing orders in any event provide that a member can raise a motion for an extraordinary meeting. So I don't see an issue with that. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, the, the reality of how it would work is that if there was an issue, we would discuss it first. Absolutely. And if we couldn't yeah. resolve it between ourselves, then we would call kind of an extraordinary um, LPB, yeah. um, or we would take it to fire authority because it depends whether it was, it was an issue about the administration and the processing of it, where the scrutiny is here, or actually it's a question about fire authority's decision, yeah. in which case it might need to go back to fire authority. Um, so I think it's, it's one of those, it depends what the, what the issue is, but I think certainly if there was something that we couldn't resolve between ourselves, then, then yeah, that, that would be it, it, It's not a situation that I think would arise due to the, the work relationship that we have. However, it could occur that um, something that come up that we would want to address it or members to be informed about, yeah. And you would say, no, I don't think so. Where would that, where would that leave us? Um, yeah. And that would be that sort of thing. That specifies that only you can do it. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm just trying to work out how we could reword this, just to make sure that that's covered. Because um, I don't, I don't see an issue with members of LPB generally, and you two are current members, also being able to yeah, request exactly. an that's, extraordinary that meeting. That's what effectively yeah. you're saying. Yes. Um, and for example, there, there may be issues around further along the road for other cases that um, are on the exact list at the minute. That it, it may be beneficial for the board to get together, maybe yeah. with some advice from from people who've actually got to do work as to whether that is, you know, a good idea to progress locally or not. You know, whether it be beneficial or, or counterproductive, um, and, and that we could have a different point of view to, to yourself. So I yeah. just think it'd be worth. Yeah, I don't think anyone's objecting to it. I think we're just trying to find a form of words, aren't we? And I'm going to reword it back with that recommendation. I know I've read it somewhere. It will be buried in here somewhere. I think we can change the wording anyway for this to instruct the lead officer to refer the immediate detriment matter back to extraordinary LPB meeting as required or requested by members of this committee. Mm. Are you happy with that? 
subject to that amendment to paragraph E, are we happy members with recommendations A, B, D, and D, and would we like to take a vote on that, Chair? Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. okay, so anybody against? Right, any abstentions? No. In which case, please, by a show of hands, show your agreement. Good. Thank you very much, members. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Item 10, I think it's back to you, Jeff. You're not going to be left alone. Thank you, Chair. Yes. Um, this is the uh, purpose of this report to, to inform the uh, board of the performance of the fund administration um, for the six month period up to the end of May um, and any actions undertaken. So you've obviously had a chance to, to read through the report. I'll just summarise some of the key areas. Um, for, for, for the Open Pension Fund as administration, we, we are continuing to work uh, remotely, as, as most of the staff are, and that's going to continue certainly into 2022 for, for us at the moment. Um, we have, within the administration, been going through a recruitment process now for the last 18 months or more. Um, we've, we've had a lot of staff leave um, or move on, um, so we have had a kind of a, a bit of an issue with uh, getting new people in and trained, and certainly that has, in this uh, current climate, been quite complex and quite challenging to, to manage. Um, I'd like to thank, actually, the, my team managers for, for managing through that at the moment. Um, one of the key areas, we, we have lots of key posts, particularly around our technical compliance um, advisor, who has moved on to the role now. Um, certainly, southwest-wise, we, we are in a challenging position whereby there's much competition in the southwest for, for people who have gained knowledge through pensions uh, administration to, to move on elsewhere. So we've become a bit of a staging um, platform for people to move on. Um, that's, that being said, um, we have uh, we have recruited into a number of vacant posts and continue to uh, sort of provide training internally to, to get people up to, <coughs> to speed. A couple of uh, key processes or uh, key statutory uh, processes have uh, taken place over the course of the last few months, uh, particularly around the work undertaken to, to issue annual benefit statements to all the firefighters and scheme members um, by the uh, statutory deadline of 31st of August. So that was achieved, and I think uh, statements went out during the last week of August to, to all the active members, deferred members were moved to a little earlier. So that was uh, successful in, in its completion. Um, there is uh, a table in there which um, flags up our performance uh, against the uh, sort of KPIs, if you like, key performance indicators. Uh, I think that have, um, we, we have kind of, in some respects, fallen short of our own standards, and uh, certainly for some of the, the SLA targets uh, most recently. Um, some of the areas where there's been a shortfall have been around the complexity of cases that we've been dealing with, uh, which have taken slightly longer than, um, than anticipated. That touches on a couple of the retirement cases that we've, we've processed, and a number of death cases. Now, these are death of uh, retired firefighter members. Um, some of these cases have been slightly over, over time because of the nature of the scheme that the member was in and the elections that member made uh, at the time they were employed. And these are pre-1975 cases, uh, whereby a lot of the information has had to be um, obtained through my group. Um, and that's uh, in our office, which isn't easily accessible at the moment. So there have been some slight delays there. Uh, right. So um, apologies uh, for, for that. We, we are looking at our own internal process. So myself and the uh, Member Services Manager will be reviewing our own internal processes um, very, very soon, um, where we very should have a reason, um, and also the timeliness of the information that we're receiving, maybe from the payroll provider as well, so we can find some instances there which has caused us an issue. Um, 
think there's a time level on one of the, on, on the table. I think it refers to November 2020. That should be 30 May 2021. Um, Sorry, where was, where was I that? I think that's on the table. Sorry. Oh, the actual 30th of November 2020. Yeah, and that should be 31st of May 2021. 2021. Okay. That's on page 67 of the bundle. Thank you. Um, the, just to pick up on the pension regulators, um, pension combat pension scans, which um, the regulators are very keen for um, administrators um, and relevant officers and managers to be aware of the sign up for. We, we have now completed the, uh, the necessary requirements to ensure that we've got processes in place to, to forewarn members where necessary and signpost members where necessary where, where transfers are in progress. Um, that, um, that actual sign up will take place. In, we, we actually, we've put the process in place now, but we haven't actually done the, the sign up yet. We actually sign up to the on the regulators' website, so that's going to take place over the course of the next uh, next week. Really, it's just uh, once you've signed up for that person, then receives all the uh, direct communications from the regulators. So we just need to make sure that the right line in there. What I will say for the fire service for firefighters members is that transferring out to a personal pension isn't something that happens very often. Most firefighter members um, usually go to if they do leave the service, they go to another, another public sector scheme potentially. Um, other public service schemes probably find that there's a lot more uh, movement outside of the, the, the defined benefit return time scheme into maybe a defined contribution scheme which does carry more risk. Um, so that's really where the, where the pension scams tend to tend to circle. But we, we have changed our process to to flat. Um, I'm happy to take uh, any, any questions. Questions? Okay, well, thank you, Jeff, for that. So, the recommendation is that the local pension board is asked to note the report, note that the pension administrators have signed up to the pensions regulator pledge to combat pension scheme, uh, pension scams, details of which will be published and communicated to members via the FBS website, and agree for this pledge and guidance to avoid pension scams to be further publicised to the members through the authorities' website, intranet, and social media. So, are you happy to take those together? Okay. Can you take the vote? Yes. yes. Okay. Any against? Any abstentions? Oh, show of hands, please. Great. Super. Thank you. That's unanimous. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, item 11, and that's back to Angela, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so, just presenting the, the scrutiny and uh, review report, this, this paper is also part for noting in consideration and part for a decision. And the decision is whether to recommend that the scheme manager at its next meeting, so the prior for its next meeting, agrees the, to the addition of a sentence which is outlined um, there, which I'll recap at the end of my presentation, um, which is recommended by LGA to the voluntary scheme, um, scheme pace policy, which has previously been considered by LGB and, and the scheme manager. Uh, and that refers to, to a timing issue to, to alert those wishing to use that scheme um, of what timings they might wish to do that and the, and the tax implications of, of not meeting those time scales. Um, after which it is envisaged that this policy then becomes part of business as usual policy and reviewed and processed as, uh, as part of that. So this is a routine report which provides members um, with information on a number of items to assist with their scrutiny of the administration and governance of the firefighter pension schemes for the fire authority. Key things to note in the report is in the period between LPBs, and that means from the previous LPB in January, there have been no breaches of law, and therefore no breaches of law are needed to be referred to the pensions regulator. And that sets out on, on comparable five point four. Uh, 5.3 refers to that whilst no statutory discretions have been enacted during this period, uh, we have as a service assisted three scheme manage scheme <laughs> <laughs> three scheme members 
with general um, issues raised and inquiries uh, with reference to pensions, which have all had favourable outcomes for those members, uh, with only one having a cost to the foreign authority, which was then duly considered by, by the People and Culture Committee uh, as, as is required. Um, now, obviously, with those numbers, I'm not going to go into great detail about what those, what those issues were, as it would identify individuals. But it related to two um, related to ill health retirement benefits, uh, with, with reference to what could be included in their calculations, um, and also what needed to be taken out of their calculations, with, with reference to other benefits they were in receipt of. And the third was actually not anything to do with our, pen, our pension scheme, which was actually contributions made by a previous employer. But we assisted that employee with kind of finding, finding the words, I suppose, to, to go back to their previous employer with that. Uh, we had one um, appeal um, raised, which is around an ill health retirement injury award, and one dispute to raise with the IDRP, which related to um, a delay in retirement benefits and also the decision around immediate detriment. Again, I won't go into details of those. They are progressing through the appropriate processes, um, which includes appeal boards and the People and Culture Committee. Um, the outcomes of those ones will be advised to a future LPB, along with any sort of lessons learned from that that you might want to consider for your, your scrutiny of the administration of the scheme. Paper also indicates that the compliance deadlines highlighted in there for reporting and provision of data have been met, where those timescales have now gone, or there are plans in place to meet the deadlines for those that, that are due. There has also been a review of the local pension board risk register with an additional risk added, which was LPB 15, which again is in, in, in Appendix B of the report. Uh, and that's a specific risk which has been added around the immediate detriment issue. And there has been some clarification of LPB 13, um, and that also refers to age discrimination and immediate detriment. So the content of that and the scores have been reviewed of that, and also that is following some guidance from the LGA. Uh, the further one that I refer to there is the sentence recommended by local the government association with reference to the voluntary scheme the scheme pays. So if I then return to the recommendations, and then I'll open it back up for, for any questions or comments, uh, the, the board is asked to note the report. Consider whether you need any more information or action is required to assist your scrutiny of those matters and also the risk register. And to consider whether to recommend the bar authority approves an addition to the voluntary scheme and pays policy. The policy that you previously looked at is at Appendix B with the addition of the following sentiments. While there is no fixed deadline by which a member must make the VSP election, scheme members may wish to be aware that if they do not want to incur interest and or penalties in respect of the tax charge, the payment has to be made to HMRC by the 31st of January in the following tax year. A payment made after this date attracts a later payment interest charge. I'm happy to take any, any questions or comments. Any questions? Um, so on the voluntary scheme pays policy, um, in my day job I occasionally have to deal with um, the voluntary scheme pays um, on defined contribution schemes and providers normally have a deadline by which they'll request receipt if the member wants payment made in time by the 31st of January. Um, so I'm just a bit, I don't quite understand why the scheme hasn't set a, this is the deadline in which we will then have sufficient time frame to pay by the 1st of January, rather than a sort of more nebulous, you need to be aware that it may or may not be made depending on the process. So, I, I, th I think, well, we, sorry, if you want me to partly answer that question, as much as I can. Um, I think we, from, from my understanding, now, is uh, that um, we, we calculate um, any pension savings issues and uh, policies of October and we advise members. Yeah. Um, I think there was that missing bit before about giving a, giving a deadline for where our members may need to or may wish to operate that policy voluntary scheme pays mechanism. Um, so I think it's just really tied, ties this in with that. Um, 
but, but then obviously also um, these issues may arise when, when we put through a retirement case where there may be a tax charge there. So I think um, that's, that's kind, of the, the, kind of the area that you're referring to. Right. So, yeah, I, I, I think I think that was myself. Yeah. Is it the case that there isn't one day that fits all scenarios? Well, there, well, there isn't. No. Okay. Right. Some could retire on, on any date. So. Okay. So, so if someone, sorry, uh, so if someone were to have an annual allowance issue, um, you, the talk came up to, their statement was issued at the beginning of October saying, again, they, they realised they've got an issue, a ta potential tax charge on the 31st of January. Um, how are you able to, you, you would be presumably be able to give them a time frame in which you would be able to process a voluntary scheme case. Yeah. yeah. So that's the, so the time frame for us is obviously issued that statement by the sixth of yeah. October. Um, we would reference if there is a tax charge within that, it would reference that the member would have the option to, to make that payment or use the fund to, to deduct yeah. the reduction of their benefits um, to, to come back and let us know by the thirty first of January. Right. I suppose what, what the councillor is saying is, is there a minimum period it would take you to process a voluntary schemes payment advance to cover a tax charge? So in other words, to make, meet that deadline of the 31st of January, bearing in mind you have Christmas in the intervening period as well, would you need to know by no later than the 1st of January, for example? Is that what you're getting That's, that's essentially what I'm getting well, I'm not sure the wording of the letter, to be honest with you, but I think we, we do ask for sort of early, I mean, if, if the information is going out by the 6th of October, I think we, we do put in there a, a kind of caveat. Please let us know. So I think what so we could do we maybe is, is say that whilst this recommendation is noted in this paper, we also note in addition that the covering letter to the person inviting them to take advantage of the scheme would point out the practicalities in terms of dates and how they need to make yeah, as much sense possible. I think that's it. I mean, it's, it's obviously as well as there's no fixed deadline, so that's it, it, you know, it's just making sure that people know that they can't just rock up on the 20th of January <laughs> <laughs> and expect it to be done. Like that's that's what. So I think that could probably be covered in your correspondence to members, as opposed to needing to be in the policy as a strict yes, deadline. Uh, and I, th I think, sorry, Chair, I think it is covered. Okay. Uh, but I haven't got that. No, that's uh, fine. Are you comforted? Yeah, that, that's, that, that's fine. Okay. It's, it, it, just looking at it. It's a very good question. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and it wasn't cute. <laughs> okay, thank you. Any other questions or points? Okay. Well, it's just a note, isn't it? It's, um, it's to note the report, but also to recommend the amendment to the voluntary schemes payment um, policy that we have to add this sentence. I think we do need to vote on that. Okay. And I would also say that we add a, a D, which is, and to note that the pension scheme administrators will highlight deadlines for payment of voluntary schemes pays to meet tax deadlines, something along those lines. Are we happy with that? Um, so noting that they will take that action away. Right. So, so we do need to vote on. I think we can take all these as a group if you're happy. Yeah. Everybody happy with that? Take, take it all as yeah. one group. Yeah. Okay. So we'll take a vote on it. Yes. Right. Are there any uh, <clears throat> any votes against? Any abstentions? Okay. Show of hands for agreeing. Thank you. And for the minute taker, I'll, I'll make sure you put the right word. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And thank you, Angela. Thank you, Jeff. Um, <clears throat> item 12 is the draft local, local pension board annual report. <clears throat> it's you again. It's me again. Yeah. 
Uh, thank you, Chair. So this is a paper coming to you for decision. At your January 21 meeting, um, the board agreed to start the practice of producing an annual report, setting out the activities of the local pension board in the previous year. Uh, that's both good practice, but also a recommendation of the pension regulator. Um, and, and it's a report which provides information, but also transparency for school members um, and the public um, about the work of the LPD. Um, and also it provides further information and assurance of the work of the LPD for the file authority as the scheme manager, because the draft report goes to them to approve. You also agreed to include uh, the production of an annual report in the terms of reference of the local pension board. And you also agreed the headline content of the report, again, which is in line with best practice, pension regulated codes of practice, and also um, the, the Pension Act. So the paper asks LPB to consider the content of the report, which is under those uh, headings previously agreed and provided in the appendix and subject to any questions or, or amendments um, that you may wish to approve the presentation of that report to the file authority at their next meeting and then publication. Uh, before I move to, to questions, there is at uh, power of 3.3 um, an error with the date. Um, and it's the Public Services Pension Act 2014 in the paper. It should be 2013. So my apologies for that, but it is correct in the LPB annual report where it references that, uh, which is at page 98 of your pack. So happy to um, open up to questions or anything you may wish to include in your annual report. Oh, I just like to say, I think that it, it reads very well. I think uh, if you sort of like take yourself out and just read it as a one-off, I think it explains and and gives reason for this board probably better than we've ever had in the past. Um, uh, yeah, no, I think it, it, it serves its purpose very well. Thank you. Anybody else? So we did, um, Council Windows, record your signature, didn't we, from at the last meeting, I think. Yeah. So we've got your signature to appear on the report. Yes. And that would go in draft format to the full file authority for them to consider. Mm. So recommendations and the board is asked to consider this report and uh, consider the report of the appendix and approve its presentation to the file authority meeting by you as LPD chair. So that would be the meeting on the 15th. So, can we have a vote on that, please? Any, any against? Any abstentions? Raise your hands, please. Thank you. Okay, so we have a vote on that, please. Thank you. Now over to 13, that's over to you. Yes, that's my Amanda. paper. So this is a paper entitled Knowledge and Understanding Policy. Um, by way of summary, this paper has as an appendix the suggested policy that I'm suggesting that we introduce for the local pension board. It's called Army, uh, sorry, Avon Fire Authority Local Pension Board Knowledge and Understanding Policy. Sorry, that's my background. <laughs> <laughs> Apologies. I thought that was something else they were going to ask. Take the girl out of the army. You can't take the army out of the girl, unfortunately. Um, so let me move straight on to the recommendations and then I'll run through the detail itself. So you're asked to approve the draft to Aiden Fire Authority Local Pension Board and Nigel Understanding Policy at Appendix A, which includes an annex. It's slightly confusing. We have an appendix to the paper and an annex to the policy. I do apologize, but that's just the way it is. Um, asking new members, so that will be yourself, Councillor uh, Brown, and also the new FBU member or, or new um, employee member, 
to um, use the annex to that policy to assess their current degree of learning and then to set themselves a personal development plan by virtue of the answers to the various questions. And then to ask existing members of the local pension board to refresh their pension knowledge and understanding by completing the online courses of the pension regulator public service toolkit prior to assessing their skills. So I think at a previous meeting we all committed to do that. I know it's a big chunk of work and I think we probably all have accounts set up already with the pension regulator to do that training, but there are quite a few modules to complete so that we can again commit to do that in time for the next meeting. So the background to this paper is that new terms of reference for this local pension board were approved by the Fire Authority back in December last year, and they now appear as part of the 2021 new constitution. Those terms of reference state in paragraph 19 that the board should establish and maintain a policy and framework to address the knowledge and understanding requirements applied to board members. So it is a gap at the moment which we haven't filled, which is why this paper is being presented to you today. At the last meeting in January, I for my sins agreed to draft that new policy, uh, which I have done. And just so you're aware and so that you can be rest assured that I've looked at best practice, I did take into account the um, Firefighter Scheme Advisory Board's knowledge and understanding policy, and that's formed the basis of the <coughs> policy, so that I'll try best practice for you. Okay. Um, there are no particular financial implications of this paper because we commit to train members regularly anyway, so it's an ongoing expense, so there's no additional expense involved. The key considerations are the requirements of the pension regulator. Um, it has published a code of practice 14 directed at scheme managers and members of pension boards of public service pension schemes. And it sets out what it regards as the requirements for members, and I've quoted those um, at paragraph 5.1. So the legal requirements are that you understand the rules of the scheme, but also the law relating to pensions generally, and case law and so on. So it's quite a big ask of members actually to be aware of all of that. The pension regulator also set out what a uh, policy should set out, and I've put the table in there at paragraph 5.2. And if you go on to paragraph 5.4, you'll see that the policy itself has several headings. One, areas of knowledge and understanding that are required. Two, the degree of knowledge and understanding required. Three, how you acquire, review, and update that knowledge and understanding. And four, how you demonstrate knowledge and understanding. Um, and as I explained before, it's based on the Firefighter Scheme Advisory Board's own policy on this topic. So if I refer you now to the Appendix A, which is the draft policy itself, um, I've got a couple of slight tweaks I need to point out to you. So on page two, you'll see it says at the top, draft August 21. That's because it was presented for the August meeting. Obviously, it is now September. So when this is no longer draft, it will be dated September 2021. That's page 113 of the bundle. And then on page three of the policy, which is page 114 of the bundle, the same error has crept in, and I can't, I'm so sorry, I don't know how this happened. The Public Service Pensions Act is 2013. I don't know why it became 2014, because it's even abbreviated yeah. correctly in the bracket. Yeah. So that is utterly bizarre, and I apologize, and that needs to be changed in 2013. Um, I don't intend to go through this section by section. Um, I would only, I think, refer you to Annex 1 of that policy. So page 9 of the paper, page 120 of the bundle. There are 10 sections here. And when you run through them, they all seem quite logical. So the things that you need to learn about. So one is my role, responsibilities, and duties as a pension board member. For those of you who've done this for years, you will know all of this, but for new members, maybe not. Two, the knowledge and understanding I need as a pension board member. Three, conflicts of interest. Four, how scheme information is published. Five, risk management and internal control. Six, record keeping. Seven, maintaining contributions. Eight, communicating members. And nine, 
resolving disputes and to have reported breaches of the law. So it's all quite logical. And the other thing I would point out, when you come to rate your skills on this um, table, it's got a really useful column at the end set which says where to find information, which includes a link to the, the TPR, means the pension regulator, it includes a useful link on the module on that topic. So all you need to do is to go onto their website, set yourself up as an account for their learning platform, and then you click on those and it will allow you to complete the training. Um, the only thing that we will ask as part of this policy is that you keep my clerk Emma informed of your progress so that she can keep a register of your training so that we can demonstrate to the pension regulator that we've all taken this seriously and completed the training. So hopefully that's how this bad tree, but does anyone have any questions for me, please? Um, <clears throat> apologies if I missed it, that's but okay. um, does the policy make any sort of, um, put any sort of time frame on this? No, I mean, I think in an ideal world, everybody would do the training before they become a member of the, you know, in a perfect world, but we all realise the world is not perfect, that's not always possible. So I think we did commit at the last meeting in January to go through the modules on the pension regulated website. I'm not going to ask members in this forum how they got on with that. I know it's a big ask, um, but I think we need to commit today to do so as soon as possible. And, and I think we've got to expect that if the pension regulator does contact us, he will be contacting all members of this board and asking them about their knowledge. So we need to be prepared for possibly having an outside agency ask us these questions. Um, so that's why it's important to take it seriously. But yeah, good question, thank you. And we do have an annual training event which is provided by LGA, which is a free annual training event, which I think runs to several hours, doesn't it, from memory? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's about half a day, I think. Mm -hmm. And that's a really useful refresh, and it focuses entirely on the complexities of every scheme. So it goes through, this is the, I don't know how many schemes there have been in the past, but it's a really useful refresh. Yeah. So I think, the, the toolkit on the pension regulators website gives you the foundations, whereas that half day event by LGA focuses on the peculiarities that you need to be aware of. So um, I think the two work well together. Okay. Any other questions? So I'm just going to say that there's also um, new members fundamentals training, which is a three day. Is that LGA provided? That's the LGA provide that and it's um, I think at the moment it's, it's a mixture of either you can do it virtually or you can actually attend in person. Okay. Those events are in London, Cardiff, and Manchester. So what we'll do is I'll ask Emma to take that as an action to investigate when the next dates are and get you and anybody else who'd like it, um, because I think there will be a new employee representative as well to put to themselves forward. Thank you, Jeff. That's really helpful. So the board is asked to approve the draft um, knowledge and understanding policy in Appendix A, ask new members to conduct an existing skill assessment and set themselves a personal development plan by using Annex 1 to that policy, and ask existing members to refresh their pension knowledge and understanding by completing the online courses of the Pension Regulator Public Service Toolkit. And I think if we can commit to do that by the time of the next meeting, that would be helpful, which is, um, it's going to be February, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Would you like to take a vote on that, please? Okay. Do we know what we're voting on? Brilliant. So, any against? Any abstentions? Raise your hands in favour. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, that's you again, isn't it? Uh, 14. Yes. The execution of 
the chair and replacement of the specialist chair. So, so councillor, yes, this is my paper, uh, recruitment of an independent specialist chair for the local pension board. We obviously have a chair for the municipal year to council windows, and I have discussed this paper in advance of council windows, so I'm not offending him, I'm assured. Um, it is just simply this has become quite a complex environment, as I think everybody appreciates. So by way of summary, um, we as a pension board commit to um, help the, the scheme manager, the fire authority, um, be legally compliant and ensure that the, the scheme is run in an effective and efficient way. But in order to do that, the members of this pension board need a good knowledge and understanding of firefighter pension schemes and the regulations in place. This year has seen, or in fact going back several years, has seen a vast number of changes. So I know this issue has been brought to this board before and then there's decided not to appoint a specialist chair. But I, I've taken the decision to bring this back to you today because things have moved on significantly uh, since then. So if I could just summarize, for example, the immediate detriment issue as an example. We had a court of appeal decision in December 2018. We had two Home Office guidance documents, one issued in August 2020, one issued in June 2021. We had a, um, a government consultation um, issued in February 21. We had an Employment Appeal Tribunal decision in February 21. We also had to um, have a very detailed, I think, 33-page advice of the QC on this topic. We have no software to deal with complex calculations, it's all manual, and we are expecting new legislation and regulations, so not just the Act, but also the regulations to deal with immediate detriment. So just that topic alone has had a raft of complicated things that have been issued. For that reason, um, insufficient knowledge and time capacity to just address that one issue has become the highest score on your risk register. So it's something which really is now uppermost in our mind. And to help mitigate that risk, what we are asking you to consider today is whether for an initial three-year period we appoint an external pension specialist to act as your chair. So this is someone who's had a background in pensions, who understands all the laws, who can then review new legislation, new regulations, and assist you with proper checking of all of this, um, particularly in relation to immediate detriment. So the recommendation to this committee is to approve the commencement of the process to appoint an independent LPB chair for initial three-year term, and if you agree with that, then to go on to approve the proposed job description and person specification. I won't go through every paragraph of my paper, but I'll just highlight a few bits to you. Um, paragraph 3.3 on page 126 of the bundle. The Constitution already contains a provision for the appointment of an independent chair to the board who would assist you in your scrutiny and governance role by adding capacity and also applying a comprehensive understanding of the law related to pensions, their experience of working in the pensions industry and extensive knowledge of public sector of pensions and processes. Um, if you go ahead with the process to a point which is set out in your terms of reference, you then make a recommendation to the fire authority and they would then decide whether to ratify that appointment. So it would be the fire authority who makes the actual appointment. At paragraph 3.6, I set out a proposed anticipated timeline. Now that was based on a August meeting of this local pension board. Obviously we're now at the beginning of September. So that timeline has slipped slightly. So I would imagine we're now saying by mid-September, or as soon as practicable, the advert can go live. And I'm going to be handing over an action point to my clerk Emma to help HR get that done as quickly as possible. Late September, I imagine we'll be trying to do some shortlisting and interviewing of candidates so that we can still try to meet the October 15th meeting of the Fire Authority to have a recommended candidate for the Fire Authority to appoint. 
There are financial implications here. Um, specialist chairs are short in supply. Um, they are very knowledgeable and their fees reflect that. And so you will see set out the likely cost is in the region of £625 per day plus VAT. And we anticipate an annual cost of between five and seven thousand. It may be initially the work is higher to deal with all these changes and then it tapers off a bit as time goes on. I think you've got to weigh that up against the cost of the fire authority of not having that expertise and potentially any problems that might occur if we get things wrong. So, so I think that may be some mitigation for that. The key considerations I've set out is that Obviously, having a specialist chair will build capacity, so you have one dedicated person who will be overseeing this pension board and all the papers that come to it. Um, there will be a higher level of scrutiny, and also that person can ensure that you have all the right information and training that you require. We are going through a, a period of change. We have got one new pension board member, elected member here today, and also we're about to lose you, Gary. So it does feel like the right time to have the backup of having a specialist while we've got this period of change. What we are also saying in this paper is that if the committee decides this is not a good idea, then in paragraph 5.8, um, we will need to have a, set, a discussion today about how we identify alternative mitigations and internal controls for this high risk. So I refer to the risk register. I can refer you to the entries in the risk register, but you will see the control that we've suggested for, for example, LPB10 on your risk register is appointment of a specialist chair. And also it appears at LPB15 regarding the Macau judgment that we consider appointing a specialist chair. So if we decide not to do that, we need to go back to that risk reg register and decide how we're gonna mitigate those risks in the absence of an expert. And also we need to um, provide, I would say as a matter of urgency then, if we're not going to have an expert, records of completion of training by all members. So I will stop talking now, I think I've probably bored you enough with this paper. So, um, if I could go back to the recommendations that are taking the questions. So, you're being asked to decide whether you approve the commencement of a process to appoint an independent LPB chair, and if so, to approve the proposed job description and person specification. Are there any questions, Gary? Yeah, just um, just around the the, the fact that or otherwise, that the new pensions advisor in this role are not seen as a neighbor. And that, to me, seems, seems wrong. Um, but obviously, it's, it's, it's in the report, and you can explain as to why. Because to me, it would seem perfectly reasonable for someone coming in to be our internal pensions advisor to be exactly the right person to be sat there and advise us on pensions. So I, please I, tell me why there are, there are very good reasons, <laughs> I think, why not. I know I can focus on the, the, the chair specialist, but I think Angie's been in charge of the appointment of the internal versus so I'll get her to speak first. Yeah, yeah, yeah so just expanding, as you say, what's already in the paper. So the, the internal pensions advisor will be responsible for kind of day-to-day -day processing. Yeah. So they'll be doing stuff around kind of, you know, working with the base and everything to do with the time of processing. And they will be responsible for writing the papers. Um, what you then need separately is someone to scrutinise their work, because otherwise yep. you're kind of marking your own homework, aren't you really? Yep. And that's what the chair would be then supporting the pension board to, which is scrutinise kind of their work as well as the, the work that kind of beings. And also, the chair has a higher level of knowledge. So what we're talking here is kind of a, a, an administrator who has a certain level of knowledge with the pensions, but they are not necessarily legally trained or anything in that area. So what you're getting for your money is that higher level of knowledge, um, which will support both this board, but also potentially the internal pensions advisor with sort of the more complex issues. So we do see that they're, they're, they're okay. separate. So, so flip it around then. Um, if we appoint an independent chair who is superior in knowledge, um, is there any way to get best value out of that to reduce the, the time we have the other internal advisor, if, if they're going to be 
think, I think, I think there level. are very different levels, and I think. Okay, I think, is that, I think, is that, yeah, I is that level of knowledge? That if that's vastly different than I, I think it, understand. I think it. it will be. So, so this is a model which is used by other fire and rescue authorities. They okay. have specialist chairs. So, Mid and West Wales, for example, yeah. have this. Um, and the way it's been explained to me is that pensions are a complex area, as we all know, and that if you've worked in this all your career and managed pension departments and pension schemes, you're then able to bring all that knowledge to the benefit of the fire authority as scheme manager and to help them negotiate new laws and certain regulations and so on. Your day-to-day -day person in the office is almost taking pressure off your HR department who are currently trying to act as the yep. go-between between people retiring and your pension administrators and payroll. Okay. And that will be the dedicated person for firefighters to go to for their day-to-day -day queries. But you wouldn't go to your QC every day with random inquiries about your pension. You'd only go yeah, to yeah. your, I'm not saying this person will be a QC, but I'm trying to make a distinction. Yeah, yeah. One's a day-to-day -day person who will do a processing, whereas the other person is much more your specialist advisor, like your particular, so. It, it um, kind of makes sense, but I struggle to see what that person on a day-to-day -day internal advisor wouldn't know that we're talking about. Because that also gives me a cause of concern if they, if they're not, <laughs> they're not versed enough in, in pensions to come and sit on this board and understand what we're talking about, how are they going to invite my members? They, they are, that, they are versed Do you know what I mean? That, I suppose there's a difference between, I suppose there's, a, there's a difference between someone who works in HR, yeah. who has a really good understanding of HR and can yeah. advise, and an employment boss as a solicitor. Yes. And for me, it's that kind of okay. distinction. That's but what you will see in the paper is that this is a new model, it's both a new model, and therefore the recommendation is that this is a three-year appointment in particular to get us over all of the immediate detriment and remedy, yeah. after which we can review it as a model and decide whether we continue with that as a kind of specialist chair. Yeah. And the other thing I would add, which I suppose was highlighted at the last meeting, was it would give you greater capacity and depth. So we weren't for it last time because your terms of reference say the chair plus three, and of course we didn't have plus yeah. three, and so the, the meeting couldn't go ahead. So it would give you that additional capacity as well, which would be helpful, I think. That's fine, thank you for explaining. There's a very good question Maybe because it's a, it, so it's, it's a period of significant well, change, isn't it, yeah, with all the changes so. coming in at the same time. Yeah. And, and with the cost, and so I tried to address it in the paper because I could foresee it was a question, but it's useful to have it because then you can have a deeper discussion than you yeah. can kind of write in a paragraph. So, yeah. I think everybody's trying to do the right thing to make right. sure that these pensions are done, are, are administered properly. Yeah, I don't, and, I, don't, and I, don't, I don't think it's a bad idea. I, it just seems that we're. Slightly in Yeah, the report says the role does not overlap, but I, I, I fail to see how. You can have an internal pension advisor and an independent chair of our local pension board that would not overlap. Surely they are going to be in conversation with each other daily, I would hope, to, to make sure that you know the, the advice that's being given out. And, I think, uh, I think uh, how, it, how it works in practice is yet to be decided. Yeah. So I, I think when we find the right person, there will be discussions that will take place between director of corporate services and that person about how that would work best in terms of how much contact they need with the day-to-day yeah. -day person. I don't anticipate it will be an everyday conversation. No, I don't think exactly. fire authority yeah. could afford that for one. Yeah. But, but I do agree. I think maybe in the early days there will be a lot more contact, but there will be yeah, later yeah. on in the term because of the, the building up that capacity. Thank you. So, any other questions? I just want to understand um, how the independent chair will sort of interact with the authority. If, for example, there were further exempt papers. Would the independent chair be entitled to see the exempt papers that would come to the fire authority? That's a really good question. Because, I mean, obviously, one of the, one of the rationales is, um, in 5.2 is the chair of the authority is very supportive of the approach, noting the complexity of recent exempt authority papers on the media Yes, detriment. yes, absolutely. So the authority has seen the exempt papers on the media de detriment. Yes. Um, an independent chair would presumably have knowledge of 
the area. My, but my, with the, obviously, my view with the is I would advise case. elected members at the time what that chair needs to see, and I anticipate in future years the chair will probably be the author of that paper. So I, as your clerk, have only had to get advice from a QC on because your behalf we because we didn't have sufficient. a specialist. So I anticipate in future it would be their paper to you saying, look, we've got this big issue, I've had to go and get an advice from a QC, and this is what the, the result of that paper was. And that would have to go directly to the fire authority because it would need decision at that level of scheme manager. But I, so I think you're right. I think, obviously, the local pension, the, the new independent specialist would need to be privy to all information regarding your work as a pensions board. I think it's quite unusual for you to have exempt reports. But, I mean, I've, I've not sat on this board more than twice. But I think it's quite unusual for there to be exempt reports because the IDRP process, the internal dispute resolution process, which tends to be the exempt reports, are taken out of this and into people and culture. Yes. So that would be dealt with separately. But again, the chair might well need to put information into that paper to answer specialist questions about why it is pensions have been handled in the way they have. So I don't see that as an issue, and you've got me as your clerk to give that backup advice as required. But I, it's a really good question to write. Thank you. You've read the papers. Thank you. <laughs> That's brilliant. Okay. Can I just um, interject here and say that, <clears throat> yes, I, I totally understand why we need this. Um, I've only been chair, what, for a very short length of time, and then COVID intervened. Um, <clears throat> I haven't got the knowledge to do the job as it should be done, um, and therefore it would be wrong of me to um, say anything other than I agree with Amanda and Angela in what they came up with. Uh, in fact, it's a little bit like a lifeline to, to, to a drowning man, if I could say so. Um, so I fully support it, and I hope that everybody else will. Okay, so are we happy to take a vote? So the, you're asked to approve the commencement of the process to appoint uh, the independent chair for initial three-year term. The process itself is set up in the terms of reference and to approve the proposed job description and person specification in the appendix. Okay. Um, are there any um, votes against? Abstentions? Can I show of hands, please? Super. Thank you very much, members. That's much appreciated. We will obviously do our best to try and find the right candidate now for you. Thank you. We've had a long enough rest, so I think it's finished. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chair. This is my final paper to, to the committee today. Um, so this is the work program for 2021-22. This is a standing agenda item, um, and it's for noting and any, and any comment. Um, the, as you can see from the work programme, it in part consists of standing items, um, which are considered at each meeting, but also specific items that will be considered by the board within the kind of year. And of note on those specific items, um, there are some suggestions there that are things that have been added, partly because they, they are things which I think need to be added, but partly because we are going to have extra capacity to assist us to look at these things, and we haven't had that kind in the past. So of note on the specific work programme, um, is that I have suggested that the work program includes regular updates on immediate detriment and the age discrimination, discrimination remedy and also the bill going through. A specific piece of work on the internal dispute resolution procedure following the publication of the pension regulators uh, fact sheet. A review of uh, the terms of reference for, for this committee, um, which is something that we agree to do annually anyway. A review of the statutory discretions. So the Fire Authority some time ago agree agreed a massive board, for want of a better word, of, um, of, of, of discretions which they would consider with reference to all of the different kind of um, firefighter pension schemes. I think what is needed now is a piece of work to make sure that that is up to date 
but also to add some clarity around there, around sort of delegations and whether all decision makings on, on, on all of those discretions need to go up to the file authorities, the scheme manager. Because I think that will be clearer for employees and also the file authorities. So I think that's a piece of work that the local pension board can do to then sort of recommend that onto the file authority. And also a further review of the risk register. Uh, we are also looking at our corporate risk register and making sure that um, we are scoring things correctly there and including everything that we need to following an internal audit um, review of our corporate risk register. So what I would like to do is apply that same, um, same review to the local pensions board risk register um, and make sure that we've got everything we need there in terms of both the scores and the controls and the mitigations in place. So those are the things that, um, since you last looked at this work programme in January, um, I, I have included um, and, and proposed it to you in terms of the work programme for the coming for the coming year. Um, and the work around those would then, of course, be included in the annual in the next annual report of fees that will be completed within the year. So you're happy to take any, any comments or, or, or queries on, um, on what the work programme is like. No, obviously some of those discussions, we, there could be a need to introduce new discussions, couldn't there? Um, around immediate detriment, etc. I'm, I'm just conscious, obviously, it's, it's not going to be me, but there's, that's going to be, I would suggest, almost a separate committee. And I think that, that there can't... There may need to be some sort of working group. Yeah, that, uh, working group is yeah. a better terminology, sorry. I, I would suggest that this board sort of like almost agrees that that be set up ASAP because those discussions I've been through many times. They, they are many and complicated, and how they apply to the changes in the current pension situation and how that moves on after 2023 isn't going to be easy. Is it? That's going to be definitely a case for whoever's sitting in the council window seat, I would suggest, because there's the, the legal side of that is a, is a minefield, isn't it? And yeah, so it where that all goes. So there's the potential forthcoming discretions what we, when we know what the new regulations look like, which we don't at the moment. But at the moment, there are a load of um, discretions within the existing schemes, which we haven't looked at and updated for some time. And also where there isn't clarity when uh, um, one of your members raises it about who the decision maker yes. is. And what we don't want is a situation where all of these need to go up to fire authority because that delays decisions for members. So there are some, obviously there are some complicated ones with big heavy financial elements which do need to go up to, to the fire authority. But there are some which, for example, myself might be able to make a decision maker on. And so it's really kind of, well, well yeah, these are the discretions we can bring, but how does that work in practice? I think it's the bit that's kind of missing for us. Is that something that, not to want to add to your technical group, but is that something that a remit that could sit in there? Because what I'm saying is, is that these need looking at now, so to get an understanding of where we are now, but almost on a, a, a a regular basis as things change, you need to check back to those discussions, don't you? And if you're if you're the group, the working group that we've got currently set up that is looking at those changes, um, will you not be in the best place to know how that relates to the discussions? Yeah, and some of this I'll, I'll leave to the sort of pensions advisor when when, when she comes in to, to determine. But certainly what we what we've spoken about with kind of the pension administrators is that we've got a technical working group at the moment which is specific to immediate detriment. But what we also need is, is a regular operational working group between Bristol City Council, um, internally us and also Baines, on day-to-day -day issues which come up. And that might be the place for it. I think I'd probably keep the immediate detra one, one separate because they've already got a lot to kind of work through. Yeah. But I would imagine in that, I don't know whether it's sensible for, for Jeff or Amos to come in at this point because I know we've had those conversations. But uh, Yeah, I think, I think they, they need to reconstitute that operation meeting yeah. between the, the three key areas, the fire authority, yeah. Bristol and ourselves, um, have that on a regular basis every other month, or every, every three months, so um, I think that's good for the last six. I think when we have the new pension advisor in here, this is a piece of work that they will be tackling almost yeah. immediately. Angie, this was just for information. 
Uh, it was information, unless anyone sort of disagrees with what is there in, in, in the work program, that they have been things that we have discussed previously, but not necessarily had the resource to do. So this is in anticipation of having that kind of additional resource. And of course, things come up like the, 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 the kind of fact sheet on IDR, IDR, IDR thing, yeah. <laughs> uh, which I do think we need to make sure that we've got our own kind of policy in place and that was updated with that kind of action. Just for the sake of completeness, shall we just have a quick vote on that? I'm sure I don't think we need to, but it might just be. Any, any objections? Abstentions? Is everybody happy with this work program? Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you, members. Okay. Thank you for that. You just did. That's <laughs> why so I'm still reeling mentally. Um, <clears throat> yes, so item 16, any other business? No, Okay, doesn't look like it. Um, item 17 is, that's back to you, Amanda. So that's just for information, the date of the next meeting is currently 25th of February next year, venue and format to be confirmed. Um, you may have realised members that the Port Emma has been struggling with venues somewhat because we still have capacity restrictions on virtually every meeting room that we use. I'm hoping by the time of next February it might be a more sensible view taken about room capacity and we might have more flexibility about where meetings can be because I, I appreciate some members are having to travel much more than others at the moment to get to these bigger venues and, and I am sympathetic to that but we're doing our very best all we can do at the moment. Um, so the same applies to headquarters. We're trying to get them to increase capacity for the roads there. But anyway, 25th of February 22. And I think, unless anybody has anything else, that's the end of the meeting. Cheers. Yes. Mark. Thanks.